Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod, beginning again for 2023, our fourth season, would you believe? They've led us back on for a fourth time. And here we go into what is a huge year. The Rugby World Cup obviously is on this year, the men's edition, the Six Nations is fizzing right now. Ireland and France, of course, the, the troubles going on in Wales, there's all sorts of things going on there. And this week, and the reason we're back this week, Super Rugby Pacific and Opiki get going. So thank you for joining us again, whether that is on Sky, on Rugby Passes platforms, YouTube, on an audio pod. We really appreciate you having you back here. I was told last year that my introductions needed some work. So <laughs> here we go. To my left, we have former All Black, Blue Centurion, possibly the mayor of North Harbour, and most <laughs> definitely the best rig <laughs> on all of Instagram for a former front rower. Oh, it's James Parsons. What a what an intro! Uh, yeah, yeah. Going, and, going. And, and not a lie either. If you want to see James Parsons oh, with no okay. shirt on, there's plenty of them. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that Bryn has been checking out plenty of those. So beaming in from Japan, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022 Super Rugby champion Bryn Hall. That hurts. It hurts, yeah. yeah. <laughs> his that teeth hurts. are as shiny as his trophies. It is Bryn Hall. Thank you for joining us again, Bryn, all the way from Japan where he plays for the Blue Revs. Thanks, boys. I'm surprised you can actually fit on that screen there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that XL, oh. XL button and toss the sponsor as well. Oh, my but, gosh. Um, no, nah, good to be back, lads. Great timing with your Instagram, at James Parsons. Yeah. yeah, just had to give the people what they want. Oh, my God. <laughs> Goodness oh. me. <laughs> I, I was doing some hard mahi, I tell you. <laughs> needed the rewards of... Uh, you, know, you know, letting the people know. <laughs> now, before we start talking footy, we've got a bit to get into. If you've joined us before, you know what we're all about. But without getting all Jerry Maguire on you, here's our basic message statement. A very complicated game, rugby. So what we're here to do is to try to break down those things. You've heard a million different pieces of jargon, whether it's running a down line, you've got a pendulum at the back. You know, we've got all sorts of amazing uh, painting pictures, sharp shoulders, Yearly law changes that happen all the time. We're going to talk about some of them soon. Rugby is a tough game to keep up with and a tough game to understand, even for people who've been watching it their entire lives as things change constantly. So what we endeavour to do is to break those things down, make them simple, make it easy for you to understand, give a bit of opinion and um, some Instagram posts. <laughs> <laughs> have plenty of fun while still <laughs> yeah. through genuine code heads just talking code. So, let's start with some quick fire predictions just to get oh, this thing going. Because we're so good at them. I don't want any explanations. I don't want any reasoning <laughs> because we know that we struggle to keep it brief at times. Who wins? And I want you to start with you, Jipper. Who wins Six Nations, Super Rugby Pacific, Opiki, the Rugby Championship and the World Cup this year? Ireland. Uh, blues. Blues. <laughs> Um, just to spice things up early in the in the year, um, rugby championship, All Blacks, um, and I'm going to go the All Blacks for World Cup. All Blacks for the World Cup, and I'll, I'll get to my reasons why later. Okay, we'll get along there. What about you? Anything different? I'm going copy and paste, but I'm going obviously Crusaders and Mata too. That'd be the only difference. <laughs> um, yeah, both of you on the All Blacks is oh, yeah. amazing, but yeah. not unexpected. Um, okay, next quick fire. Will Rassi get himself banned from the World Cup on Twitter before even getting the chance to go? No, he's a smart man. He's too <laughs> smart for that, I think. I think he knows when he um, pushes the boundary, he's probably going one too fast. I don't think so. No. You think he's going to be there? No, he won't, but he'll bend the rules. That he'll bend it a little bit. He'll still be a bit controversial, which I'm looking forward to. Who will be the All Blacks coach in 2024? Oh, um, I, I think it's dependent on what Ian Foster wants to do. Um, but we'll probably get into that more. More, but if he wants to move on, then you'd have to think. You know, Razor with the six titles mm. has got the inside running. Well, we're hearing a lot about early decisions, especially from Razor. So, Foster <laughs> might not even have the chance. What are you thinking, Bryn? Yeah, I think 2024. Yeah, Razor will be coach. That's what I'm thinking. Razor Robertson has been asked a lot about this job recently, and he's been pretty candid. You know, he's basically said it's going to happen soon and the smile on his face has indicated that he could be the guy with the job. But we're hearing stories about him possibly coaching in Fiji, going overseas. A million people want a piece of this guy. But at the moment, he's got to coach the Crusaders. Bryn, you know Scott Robertson very well. <coughs> is this something that is going to be a distraction and going to be a problem as they go through Super Rugby if this decision is imminent? I don't think so. I just know in that environment, um, you know, he'll put that aside and it won't really be touched on, um, especially in that group. He'll be um, pretty motivated around 
um, the seventh title. And, you know, if that's been his last, um, his last campaign, um, I know that's not just him. There'd be a lot of other players after the World Cup that would be leaving as well. So they'll be pretty um, good around their theme, based around their theme, and um, they'll keep it pretty in-house around what their motivations are just for the Crusaders of the group. But, um, you know, as a Razor, he'll be talking to himself as well around um, the opportunity of maybe coaching the All Blacks in 2024, if, or if not, given earlier um, with what New Zealand Rugby announced in the next, hopefully, very, very soon. Don't underestimate the amount of planning that goes in prior to this time. Like, yes, there's on-the-grass coaching. He surrounds himself with some great technical, tactical coaches, and he puts a lot of work, from my understanding, Bryn, into that theme. So I don't. I think he manages himself, and he knows his limitations so well. That's what he's shown um, everyone in terms of the people he puts around him. So I, I don't think it will impact his ability um, at the Crusaders, and, and no doubt he's made it pretty clear he's probably this is his last season, um, and he loves that place more than most. So I don't think he'd risk anything um, to to go out a winner. You mentioned Ian Foster. Do you think that it's the right thing to name this coach before the season is up? I, I think you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't because it's really reliant on, you know, I suppose, that World Cup final. But also understanding, like what I said, no one knows where Ian Foster's at in terms of does he want to stay on, does he not? You know, Because that changes the whole thing. And then it's, it's a hard place to be in as, as the decision makers, but I think the question you have to ask is not really do we go early, do we go after, it's... Where are the pros and cons in terms of the candidates that we want to apply? Are we going to lose them if we go early? Are some people not going to be able to apply because they're contracted and they're not sure where they're going? And then if, if you go late, are you going to lose candidates? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think from a coaching point of view, there's an element of like, I back myself, I'm going to win. If I want to stay, I back myself, I'm going to win this World Cup and, you know, make a statement. But then there's also the other side of me that thinks if I'm a coach and I'm not going to have a role past the, the World Cup, then the earlier the better because there's a lot of jobs in club land at the moment. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I say I do think you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But I think you've just got to make a decision, make a call back yourself based on those pros and cons around getting the best candidates at the table. For Razor, right, for, as an example, um, you know, the England job and the Australian job was probably two jobs that we think that um, if he wasn't going to coach the Blacks, that would be where he'd be going. You'd have to think so. If he was going to apply or go through that kind of um, opportunity. And for the fact that he's turned it down, just for me personally, it just shows that for me, I think that he's, there's a reason why he's staying in New Zealand. So this is obviously behind closed doors. He might have been told that he might be the coach and that's why he stayed around. We don't know that we're not privy to that information. There might be out there that we don't know. But I just think the fact that he, he'd given up the job and didn't talk around having really serious thoughts with England and Australia, I think he must have been told something that he's going to have the job post the Rugby World Cup, whether the All Blacks won or not, because he wouldn't have gone through the process around going to England, having Australia and having those communications chats of really having an opportunity to coach those teams. I think it's the kind of position that we've been put on based around last year's season and so much, I guess, so much talk around um, if, if Ian Foster was going to stay or who's going to go. I um, mean, then there's a lot of talk around that South African game. That was his last, possibly his last game, but then they end up winning and then the players backing Ian Foster. And so... The good thing for Ian is that he's obviously got the backing of the group, um, which is the most important thing. One thing that he really needs is for the players to pull together. And I think one we saw, thing we saw last year is they came out as Super Rugby and we saw that maybe they weren't in the right position to beat Ireland and beat these other teams. What needs to change, Jipper, about Super Rugby to have New Zealand's players in a better position to compete on the international stage? What elements of the game need to improve? Well, I'm actually going to st steal the, the words of um, the, the coach himself, uh, Ian Foster, and, you know, their big focus is speed around the ground. You know, getting around the park, getting to position before you're opposite. So the old cliche of winning races stands true. I think physically, if, especially if you watch that Blues um, Chiefs preseason match in terms of that physical presence of, of big bodies and being able to do similar things at that international level, I think we're there now. I, I really do, especially in that type five. But we need to beat people around the corner into spaces and create the opportunities um, that makes defences have to commit somewhere, which allows that space elsewhere. So effort. It, it is effort, but it's a little bit more than that. It's it's putting yourself in a position to make a make a um, everywhere. Like if you look at Ireland, they are so good at putting bodies in motion 
and it, it, it's it's not an effort. I don't question any player's effort, but it's just around maybe simplifying systems. There's, there's many elements to it, but the faster you move, the faster you get in position, the faster you'll be able to see what the opportunity is and you'll be able to take it. And then on the flip side, defensively, the faster you set, the faster you can come up and get up and shut the ball down. And if they're not set and ready. So it's really simple. It's just moving as fast as possible to where you need to go. A to B, A to B, A to B, off the ground, off the ground. You know, all those little things, you know, even the new law changes, I think you'll see that filter into the international game of getting to line outs quick, getting to scrums really quick and, you know, getting that ball in play. I think it was um, Ireland, um, France, 48 minutes ball in play. I think the average of Super Rugby was around 32, 33 last year. You know, that's, that is an increase in ball of play. NRL's at 52. So, you know, that's a massive increase in, in, a, in a short space of time, but that's the mindset those two teams, one and two, have got, is ball in play and just playing this game at pace and direct. It's interesting, because Bryn, I suppose the myth is that New Zealand always plays quick rugby, but it appears that the structure that we're playing to is actually quite slow in comparison. Like coming back to what the point of where the All Blacks need to improve, it's the efficiency of being able to do your job with, with whatever that may be. So we talked around break, we talked around breakdown a lot last year. So if the if the ball's in play for that long period of time, the efficiency of your breakdown every single time is really important because we, whenever we play a fast tempo game, the likes of Aaron Smith, we can get the ball out quick. We can use our forwards that are good with the ball in hand and being able to get to the edge where we made massive improvements last year. Um, it makes it a lot easier for our job to be able to do that. But um, I guess it's just being able to stay on for those long periods of times. So like look, you look at that France Ireland game, the amount of phase that you had to defend, or the amount of times that the Irish who had the um, animation in the same place every single time. And they didn't get it always the right time, but because they ran it every single time, the right line, they were able to then pick the right choice um, after four or five opportunities. So I think that's just where we need to get to. And I think in those moments in big games, it's been able to stay in it for long periods of time. And I think the breakdown, especially with those Northern Hemisphere teams, they're in a really good place of being able to do that um, consistently. And so across the board in Super Rugby, is that something you need to practice week in, week out, Bryn? It's not something that you can step up and do yeah. in international rugby? Well, I just think you saw it last year, the, the improvements that the All Blacks had to make. You know, their Irish series, um, the breakdown area was massive, and it's probably where the Irish were able to have the attacking priorities for 17, 18 phases. And so you'd like to think in Super Rugby, that's going to be a massive area that the um, that the players will want to get right. You know, I look at that Chiefs and Blues game, man, the physicality around the breakdown and the efficiency was really, really good. And so the ball and play and the level of um, attacking um, edge play was good to see. So, um, and I like to, I like the new law change, obviously, with um, the speed to get to the line out, speed to get to the scrums. Um, it's actually going to have a lot of influence probably on your bench role with guys being able to play um, a lot more minutes and being able to have your depth in your squad. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really good. I'm looking forward to those new laws and especially uh, the new number eight law. Uh, thank God I left New Zealand because um, <laughs> there's no way I want to so we coming off the back of it. Uh, of this one. So well, I love that law. Um, it's a really great law and it's great to see um, back in the competition moving forward. When you look at Super Rugby this year, you're going to see countdown clocks at 90 and 60 seconds for uh, conversions and penalties. You're going to see five second clearing of balls at rucks. You're going to see a change to the way the TMO is done where basically all refs are just going to give a yellow card. It's going to go upstairs and then they're going to say, OK, you have a look now while play continues as to whether this is a red. And then before the 10 minutes is up, they make a decision as to whether it gets extended to a red card. Doing all of these things to speed up the game. They've listened to the stakeholders. Yeah, they have. And I, I applaud the administration for going down this, this way of thinking to make the product better. But it is key to note that there actually isn't a lot of new innovations. A lot of them were written into law, especially the scrum ones and the conversions and so forth. So those are things that maybe have been slightly policed at times, but now there's a concerted effort from the referees to do so. The line-out one's interesting. Most of the time it is about getting to the line-out as fast as possible anyway, but there definitely does seem to be a shift in the preseason games that we've we've witnessed. The scrum one we know is massive. You can already see um, you know, changes there. Um, and in the TMO, I just think that's that's the that's the gold right there because everyone, in terms of the stakeholders, said that you know watching a replay five times over um, isn't what they want to do. So it, it's a system that potentially solves that. Um, but like anything, uh, when you change something, there's always a, a cause and effect. So you know until we see it in operation, um, we we won't know completely. There is one rule that I, I'm going to be interested to see how they do officiate. It's the ball of the ruck for five seconds because if you're smart. And there will be a lot of players that will count it out in their head. One, two, three, four, five. And if you're going to try to set up a caterpillar for like most rugby teams now to do a box kick, 
how are they really going to officiate that? Officiate that because I look at James Lowe on the weekend, like a couple of weekends ago, counting down the ball, um, one, two, three, four, five, and then the ball not being played. So I'm going to be interested to see how they officiate that because you're going to have smart players that will try and do that. And are they going to officiate that and ping that? or say the ball's out in that moment. So it's going to be interesting to watch and see that rule uh, take place. I think the refs are going hard at north and south as well. So any players that are falling on the other side of the ruck purposely to slow the ball down and not allow that five seconds to start, they, they will go hard at that. You know, there's a clear focus to create space. And if, if, if someone tries to roll south or north, if there's the ruck, they want you to run you know, east to west and, and get out of the way so the ball is playable straight away. And so I think that'll be the first focus of the referees. It won't be about this five seconds. It'll be like, what's stopping the ball from being available five seconds? If it's you as the attacking team trying to set up a centre well, I'm going to tell you to use it. But if there's a player blocking you or purposely trying to look innocent, then... Yeah, I'll ping, and you saw that the other, the other night. There's a lot of players that got pinged for lying on the wrong side of the ball. We talked a lot about the Caterpillar centipede um, ruck, Bryn. Maybe a quick explanation of what it is before we carry on. Yeah, of course. Um, it's pretty much just a ruck that a halfback sets up to make a long ruck to be able to make to kick the ball. So you usually see, and when we see in the season, you have someone that's um, that's carried the ball, and then you have someone that's protecting it over over the top of the ball, and then you start to make a centipede or a long ruck from that. So guys that are there's maybe one or two more right behind to make the, the, the ruck long. So therefore the, the defensive side can't charge down the ball off a, off a box kick. So you'll see a lot of that um, during Super Rugby. And you see it in the international game as well with a lot of um, kicking base teams like um, Ireland and France, for example, and um, England. We love to see a box kick in a Dewey night in Christchurch, Bryn. And we're starting with the Crusaders versus the Chiefs this Friday. Before we go on to that game, into a prediction. Now we're going to run our predictions slightly differently. What we're going to do is we're going to go through every team in Super Rugby, and the guys went through and did this last night, go through every team and rate them, 12 through 1. Across these different elements, we're talking type 5, Lucy's, halfbacks, midfielders, and outside backs. Assign points, and then at the end of it, we add up those points and we see who is going to be the best. Start with you, Jipper. How did you rate these teams, the top four teams in each of those positions, and then add them together and see what your top eight looks like this year in Super Rugby? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, starting with type five, I think I've gone the Crusaders top um, just over the Chiefs purely because of the depth they've got in that type five. You know, they've got strong, um, you know, locks and squad members, but at prop, which is such a key position, and we're talking about the speeding the game up, having the ability to bring international players off the bench is huge, and, um, you know, they've got them in droves, so I think they take the nod there. I've gone the Chiefs second, um, probably more so on what I saw the other night. Like, when Taki Aoho came on and Brody Retallick and, you know, they've got uh, Tupo Vai as well, maybe, like, they've had a few injuries, like the Angus Tarvel not being there at prop is, you know, that tight head position maybe is probably their only position that they'd be looking at. But outside of that, they've got a really strong type five. Um, I've gone the Brumbies at three just because this is their game. Their bread and butter is up front. They love driving malls. They love just being direct um, and, you know, taking it to you and also at set piece they've got two big bodies that'll disrupt your ball if you can disrupt that ball it's massive and then fourth for me in the type five I've gone the blues um, and, and I, I think they've got you know strong contenders led extremely well in that type five by Patrick Tuipolotu and, and I don't know if you saw but um, and Bryn will love this is Cam um, Swifor played at lock the other night and I was interested that he got put there but man alive he had a game so they actually proved to me there's enough depth in that squad, um, you know, to, to warrant being in that fourth spot. I've got um, the exact same top four. Um, I've just changed. I just had the Chiefs just in front of the Brumbies. Um, so I went the, I actually went, I went the Crusaders, the Crusaders first. I actually went the Blues. I went the Blues second. Is it a similar kind of setup for the Lucys as well? Uh, the Lucys, what did I go for the Lucys? I went the Blues actually for first with the Lucys. Um, I had the Blues first with the Lucys. They've got a great starting, um, six, seven, eight, I think. Dynamic, powerful, work rate. Um, so I had them at first. I, then I had the Chiefs at, a, at second. I had them second with obviously Kane, Jacobson and, and Peter Gusso Okulu is going to be massive with the points we talked around with the back of a scrum. Um, he's going to be huge for them. Uh, then I had the I had the, the Crusaders um, third and then I had the Brumbies 
I had the Brumbies um, come in with Valentini, Samu. Beautiful. Well, I've got the Blues too. I think again, it's a depth issue. You know, you've got a uh, you've got absolute X factor up front, but they've also got that second tier in behind. And we've seen time and time again, old six titles over there. <laughs> you're going to need your whole you're going to need your whole squad. Um, Hurricanes. I've gone second. I think I just kind of I just can't have them not in the top two with Adi Savia being there. I think Duplessis Karifi is another one. You know, you'll see as a young man that you know could really come onto the scene. So I like their mix of um, Lucy's went the Chiefs third, and I've actually gone the Tars fourth. I think um, Swinton's back. Uh, they've got obviously Hooper. Um, and an, an, um, Charlie Gamble, I just love the way he plays, man. Like he just one of those hard on your sleeves blokes. Um, I don't know, he's infectious to watch. So I, I think they're they're a worthwhile mention. It um, and the way they use their loose forwards to their strength, it's not so much that um, you know physical side of the game. They're just really smart in the way they use them in the width and attack, but also defensively they just go low and they create that opportunity for jackals. Okay, that's the forward packs out of the way. How do you see the halves, Brenner? Your area of specialty. Who was on top there? Yeah, I found this. I found this really, really hard actually, because um, there's obviously good players, either a good nine or a good ten. So collectively, I tried to bring them both together with nine and ten. So I actually had, um, I actually had the Blues. Had the Blues when you got Finlay, Christine, you got Bowden, Barrett. Those two together, um, it's a pretty f- f- formidable um, one-two punch. And then I've gone. You can't go past obviously Drummy and um, Richie Mwanga. They've won six titles, six titles together. You got Willie Hines coming back, who's I think a great a great signing for them to be able to bring experience with with myself leaving, and then you've got a young guy with Noah Hotham, who's I think he's going to be a kid to watch in the next couple of years. Very good, um, bring something different than both those two players. So, I've got um, I've got the Crusaders in at second. I've then gone the I've gone the Chiefs because you've got Damian McKenzie and you've got a great. Um, halfback pairing with um, Ratima, Ratima and Braid Webber and you, you could choose Bryn Gatlin as well who had a great season last year whether you have Josh Iwani in there as well so the depth that they have in the inside pairing is very very good um, and then last I have gone who have I gone last I went the Highlanders you've got Falau Fakatava and you've got Aaron Smith two incumbent All Blacks I've actually gone the exact same it was hard to leave the Brumbies out because I think I still think Olusio has got a lot to offer um, and, and obviously Lonergan's there and they've got that international experience. Same, um, I like the mix at the, at the Tars um, with Gordon um, and Harrison and, and you know, they've, they've got a few guys that can play that sort of 15, 10 role. Midfield. Uh, I've gone Crusaders, just plethora. Of, of talent, you know, you got Havili, you got Eno, you've got Good Hugh coming back, you got um, Lester Fayanganuku that can slip in there. Um, it's just, you know, it's just endless um, options. So they take um, out top. On the Blues, second um, with a tight race with the Chiefs. I think you know they're pretty evenly matched in that midfield. Um, you know, obviously Roger and Rico, and Rico is probably in the form of his life. Um, Anton Leonard Brown coming back um, is massive. So, and I, I think you know his match with. Sadly, that Alex Nankel is leaving, but um, you know he, he's he's a key part of that squad, and he looked like a player who had a point to prove the other the other night. He was just all energy, and then I've got Moana Pacifica uh, for fourth. I, I just think Levi Almua is just X factor. Um, he's got enough support around him, but he he is a player that he can change games, and I think you know you have to acknowledge his ability at midfield. Yeah, I'm presuming you like the Crusaders midfield, Brenner. Yeah, so I had the Crusaders at first. Um, and then I actually had I had the Hurricanes. I think the Hurricanes and the and the depth that they have. I think you've got Jordy Barrett, who's probably going to be playing twelve um, for them. And then you've got Proctor and you've got Umanga Jensen there as well. Um, you've got Riley Higgins, who I think is going to be a young, great, um, up and coming um, guy there. So I've gone the Hurricanes, and then I think I've gone the Chiefs. I went the Chiefs, and then I've gone the Blues. I split those two. That's interesting. I, I was expecting someone to say Blues top based off the fact that the top two starting midfielders are probably two of the most X-factor midfielders in the world. Um, but they don't have a huge depth in behind the way the Crusaders do. No, not like the Crusaders. And I, I think Bryn makes valid points on the Hurricanes too, to be fair. Um, as he sort of read those names out, it was like, yeah, you, they definitely warrant to be in the conversation. So I, I think it was probably the hardest one to pick. I, I felt like the midfielders, they were all pretty evenly matched and, and that all-black talent is quite widespread. So it'll be really key on those extra members in and behind them. Yeah, and what about them? 
as far as the outside backs? Oh, outside backs? Oh, my forte, obviously. Spent a bit of time on the wing. Um, <laughs> I've gone Blues. I think they've got X Factor purely because I would have gone probably the Crusaders had Will Jordan been there because you can't not have a team. But he he's obviously still making his way back. So I think that at this current point in time, um, it puts the Blues ahead in terms of, um, you know, especially where a guy like Mark Talao got to. Um, and you've got Caleb Clark, and I think I think Stephen Pettifet is just growing in confidence. Um, whether it's him or Bowden at 15, I think it's a good mix. I've gone the Crusaders second, I've gone the Chiefs um, third. I, I think they looked outstanding from the back, and, and seeing Sean Stevenson get some good minutes at 15 um, is really exciting. And, and you know the way Damien uh, ran the cutter and his ability to slip back there, and obviously Gats is there as well. I don't know. I just think there's a nice uh, mix in their squad for that back three. Uh, and then you've just got to put the drawer in there. You know, the, the flying Fijians, the X Factor. They, you know, they're going to be outstanding from from the back. I mean, obviously balancing it with their kick strategy and, and not overplaying their hand, but from an entertainment point of view and, and excitement factor, where I read it, I, I, and their form. Pre-season um, and their ability to score long-range tries from an outside back point of view, they have to be there in the top four. Even without Mbossi? Yeah, a- absolutely. I-, I just think it's their that's their natural way of playing, and they, they they're not afraid to chance their arms. So um, I back them to to be uh, you know a real point of difference out there. Very similar top two with Joe. I found it hard to go with the Blues and um, the Crusaders, but I the fact that you had I had Will Jordan if he is playing, um, he's the difference for me. But if he's not playing. Then I'd have the Blues with the likes of Mark Talia, Caleb Clark, and you've also had AJ Lamb, who was great last year with, mm. with a few injuries to Caleb Clark. Also, and Bryce Heem again can cover that position. Even Roger Tuivasa-Shek, we might see him possibly mm. in the wing in some back ends of game. So um, the Blues, and then um, I went the, went the Chiefs with Satoru and, and Stevenson and Damian McKenzie and Joshua Wane, wherever they played Damian. Obviously, they might play him at 10, but if he's at fullback and that plus with, the, with Sean Stevenson and, and Satoru, um, it's a great back three. And then, yeah, you could go the Hurricanes. I think, again, they've got great with where I see Julian Severe, who's um, who's defying, um, defying age with the winger, power winger. But I agree with Joe. I've gone the draw. If there's one position that um, when it comes into this ranking system where you'd back them, it would be the outside backs because um, it doesn't matter if they're coming off the bench or whoever's starting. Um, Any time they get their hands on ball, um, it, it's tough to defend them. We've seen pitches, um, especially early on in that preseason game, and you give them a bit of space and a bit of room, um, they'll punish you. So um, I went to draw uh, coming in fourth with um, their ability with the outsides. Having seen Jipper on Instagram, would you say he's built like a winger these days? I don't know. Well, you would say uh, I'd probably say two years ago when he was lean and he was, you know, 80 salt, 80 odd cages, but he's got bigger up top now. Look how tight that triple XL shirt is on him. So I, I honestly I do not know what I was thinking. <laughs> if, I, if I'd done it earlier in the year, you know, it would be forgotten about. Like, I just clearly wasn't thinking, so I've got to take the heat. I've got to take the heat. Uh, it's just purely out of jealousy, though. Oh, uh, like, yeah. I mean, in the end. Well, the post is purely out of vanity. <laughs> 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 and supporting my mate, of course, who's helping me train. Of course, we're going to get the handles uh, along yeah. the bottom here so people can uh, check out these pictures um, as the season goes on. Oh. <laughs> so our top eight, so, I, I guess okay. we're going to... So with all of that said, you combine your points from all of those five elements. Let's find out which team is the best squad with the inside running to be Super Rugby champions. Yeah, well, thankfully it's consistent with my prediction. I've got the Blues at top, <laughs> Crusaders second... <laughs> Um, I'm going with the Dalton Papali'i uh, theory of you've got to lose one to win one. So that's that's my boy Dalton. Uh, Crusaders second, Chiefs third, Brumbies fourth. This was hard, but they was, was they were tied. But you know, give a bit of Australian love there. Put them fourth. Canes fifth. Uh, I had the Tars at six, the Landers at seventh. Then I had three teams um, in the draw: MP and Reds at at eight. But I, I've picked the draw just based on preseason form. They can. BMI 8. And Brenna, when you added up all of those numbers from your rankings across the board, I'm presuming that the top yeah. two are the other way around. Yeah, correct. You. Good, good <laughs> maths there, Ross. Um, yeah, I've gone um, gone the Crusaders first. It was tight, though. It was it was really, really tight. One or two points between the Blues. So I think those would be the two and four teams in the um, when it comes to the back end of the season. But the Chiefs, man, the Chiefs, um, yeah. they've come in in third. Just on the Chiefs, if, you, if they can get... You know, we talk about a spine. You know, if they can get Tokiaho, Retellick, um, Tupo Vai, Sam Kane, Peter Gus, Weber, McKenzie, Stevenson, Satura, all these names, you know, you, and obviously Anton Leonard Brown, who I think was a massive piece that they missed last year, having all those guys on the field. 
Um, they're going to be very, very tough whether it comes to the Blues and the, and the Crusaders if it comes into that finals period. But I've gone the Hurricanes four. The Brumbies are at five, so they've switched with um, with Chip there. I went the Highlanders at six, um, and the Waratahs are at seven. And on the point system, I've got the Reds finishing at at, at the bottom eight. Of the, sorry, to finish eight in the top eight, but. I'm going to go against that with the draw. I think the draw with their positioning of how they went in the preseason, I've got them finishing the top eight. But if you went through the point system, our Reds, our Queensland fans, they make my top eight. But I don't know if they're going to be fans anymore. <laughs> You've just said they made my top eight, but I'm changing them for the draw. <laughs> <laughs> for the fact that they were on the point system, they were a top eight. But I'm going to the draw. They're going to be the um, they're going to be the big movers um, this coming season. Okay, and anyone who's watched the show will know that you're the president of the Rebels fan club. Uh, whereabouts are they yeah. sitting on your list? Yeah, uh, the Rebels. I tell you what, they had a couple of good signings, but no, I've got them 12. I've got them at the right <laughs> of the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> right at the bottom, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's going to be tough for our... It's going to be tough for the Rebels. You've got to load He's up that brutal, dartboard. He's a brutal, man. He's a brutal, man. He said that with a, with a smile on his face. <laughs> I don't have to play them this year in the Rebel round yeah, at all, true. so I'm yeah. not them at the moment. But, um, I had them the Rebels coming in class. From what I remember, when you did have to play them last year, you scored a try and you guys won by heaps. So you don't have to worry about too much. Well, you know, but I did get a few DMs, just people just absolutely telling <laughs> me when it came to them. So, uh, they might get a win here and there. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> All right, okay, well, let's go from there to the tipping. Um, we've got a tipping league. We want you to enter superrugby.co.nz slash tipping. You'll see it across the bottom here. Go to there, enter it. You can win $5,000 first prize through that competition. But look for our league. Look up the league and you'll find Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Look that up and you can join us and you can go head to head with us. Um, you know, <laughs> you probably won't have any trouble beating us. <laughs> um, but please go there. We'd love to have you on board for that tipping comp. We'd love to interact with you. The same this year. Obviously, if you're watching on YouTube or you're anywhere within the social media sphere, leave some comments. We want to read your comments. Be gentle. Interact with your comments. Be gentle. It'll probably save you abusing him and his DMs. <laughs> you know, just, just put him out in the open and we'll, we'll put him there. Especially when he picks the All Blacks off the back of oh, five straight no. losses to win the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seven tests, that's all I need. <laughs> so, yeah, please join us on that. So, who are your tips going to be for Super Rugby Pacific this weekend? Um, in, in order, game order? Yeah, Crusaders, Chiefs. <clears throat> Chiefs, I think. I just think the Crusaders will always rise to the top, I do think, but it, potentially just with the number of players out and, a, and potentially a slow start and the way the Chiefs played, I think they might get it away from home. Ooh wee, first up, away from home. I was so impressed by them yeah. the other night. Honestly, like the, the impact their big names made, like that's what you need to see early in the season. To come off the All Black break and the speed and the power they showed and just determination and focus. Like Samasoni Takiaha, I hate to keep going back to it, but that he's cold blooded, man. Like he is just all business. It's um, and I think there's a lot of those senior All Blacks wanting to make a statement in Super Rugby to get themselves on that plane to France um, and, and they're ready to peak. Not taking away from the Crusaders, I think it'll be tight, um, but I think the bigger players have played a bit more minutes um, in the preseason, which probably sets them up. I think over 80% of the people in the tipping league are going the other way. Yeah. So this could be your bold move to start. Well, I've already done my picks and I'd click the Crusaders. I did it before Friday night, so it was my one that I was... Um, right. I just I did say, Christ, it's a home Crusaders, of course. No, no brainer. But then I watched that game Friday and I was like, oh, yeah. So you've gone back and changed the pick? Not yet, but I will. It's tough. Like, if there is one team that um, that has to have given the Crusaders problem, it is the Chiefs. And so, um, you know, there's probably no better time really to get them. But um, yeah, I'll go the Crusaders in a very close game. But again, I will not be surprised if it goes the other way because, you know, for the points that I bought when it came to, comes to the Chiefs, um, they're a tough team and they always give the Crusaders problems. But um, I'll go the Crusaders uh, 1 to 12. Very close game, though. Probably the match of the round. Definitely the match of the round. All right, Tars, Brumbies. Brumbies. Yep, I'll go Brumbies. Moana Pacifica versus Drua. Oh, I've had some tight battles pre-season. I think I might go, I know that the Drua in my eight, but they were equal with Moana Pacifica, so, but I just think that home town advantage, I'll, I'll go Moana Pacifica. Mm -hmm. uh, that Drua will get those points back later on. Hopefully. Okay, <laughs> you, Brenna? 
Yeah, I, I think it's just the element of just travelling and the first game and being at home and being comfortable. Um, and I think, again, it's been the first game of the home season. It's always great for a player, the first game of the season. They'll be buoyed by being at home. So um, I'll go Moana Pacifica, but man, yeah. The Fiji and Droa's um, pre-season performances uh, would not be surprised if they get a win here um, in Mount Smart. The other interesting one this weekend, Landers v Blues. I think people are writing off the Landers in the most part as, a, as one of the New Zealand teams that's not going to be that high up. But at home to start against the Blues, it's the kind of game that the Landers just will Love. go and win just to show everybody, Bryn. Yeah, and I think they don't have Aaron Smith either. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, obviously, got Falau Fakatava, who's coming coming back from ACL. And Drini's going to be able to play a lot more minutes, which will be great and interesting to see how he goes. But I think not having Aaron Smith in that team is just a, it's a hurdle too much for them. Um, I know it's down on the it's a, it's in Forsyth Park, correct, Ross? Yeah, yep. Tough. It's a great. It's a tough game always to play down there. It'll, it'll suit the Highlanders in that condition. But I think not having Aaron Smith and the performances of how the Blues have been um, over the last 12 months to 24 months, um, they get the job done um, pretty convincingly, I think, 13 plus. Yeah, look, I think the Blues win. Um, but similar to the Chiefs going to the Crusaders, like the Landers really roll up when um, Auckland come to town. So um, it'll, it'll be tighter than most think initially, but I think the Blues will run away with it um, in the last 20. Reds, Canes? Canes. Canes, is that simple? Yeah, Gaines. Gaines. Easy. That was quick. Force <laughs> versus That's the Rebels. Rebels away from home, Bryn. It's against the Force. Yeah. Well, last year I was up. I was on the Force bandwagon, wasn't I? We're like, he's, they're making the top eight. But um, no, nah, I will go the Force. I'll spice things up. I'll back the Rebels. Yes. Yes. So we can come in next week and yep, I have to. Yep, I can be last. My tail. Yeah, yeah. I can be last in the tipping league. Yeah. You, you'll be a hero to both of the rugby fans in Melbourne. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be huge. Right, okay, well, that's our tips for the weekend as far as Super Rugby Pacific is concerned. Now let's move on to Opiki, the second big year of Opiki, coming off the back of what was a tremendous World Cup for New Zealand. There's a lot of momentum behind rugby. I was talking with Ruby Tui the other day and she was talking about how there are so many people still talking to her about it, still excited about it. Ruhe Demand said to me, hey, you should see what it's like at preseason training from grassroots up. People are turning up and they're in shape. Oh, this, they're, The role is on for this competition. Yeah, and there's just so much energy around it. And it's, you know, unfortunately COVID impacted last season's one. So it was a challenge, couldn't get crowds there. Whereas now off the back of that World Cup, the excitement is um, extreme. But also I think our other game changer is all the squads are pretty even. You know, you take the sevens players out and, and it probably, you know, when they're in, the Chiefs Manawa are hot favourites, but taking them out has just brought everyone um, to, a, to a level pegging, which I think has created a lot of excitement for your region because there's a belief that anyone can probably pick this up. Right. So if we look at what we went through last time with, uh, with Pacific, how would you rate the teams from four through one? Um, so type five, I, I've gone the Matatu f number one purely because they've obviously got the Black Ferns front row and that was a massive shift. Um, in terms of providing that platform, and, and they did such a job up front, um, and, and I think that that is a key part, um, and their ability to get around the uh, the field and, and do their job. So those three, being you know, injury um, is obviously plays a part, but at the moment they're fit and well. So I've got Mata two one. I've got the Chiefs, um, you know, second. I think Luca Connor is an awesome player. Um, you know, obviously coming off the bench, but she's got a she's got a hell of a leadership role in that team and, and leads by example. Um, you know, and, and I think they've just got that depth at lock. Um, Charmaine Smith going there is a big, big play, so I think she'll play a big part. Power at third, you know, they've got Crystal Murray going down there. They've got the old, um, the, the, the jump of all jumps and Jonah Ngawu um, for the Black Ferns. So uh, I think they'll be well versed. And, and then I have the Blues, just purely they've got a lot of rookies. Um, they've obviously got Maya Roos there, but um, around her in that type five is, you know, um, some young players coming through. Mm, mm. Are you happy with that lineup, Bryn? I think the biggest thing for me um, when it comes to Mata 2 last year, they'll probably be a little bit disappointed with how they went last year. Um, for me personally, I thought they were going to do um, a little bit better. And so um, the tight five is obviously really, really important. So um, I went Mata 2, the Chiefs, and then Hurricanes and Blues to round out that, um, that bottom, that bottom, sorry, not the bottom, but um, third, third and fourth, sorry. Loose forwards. 
I think these next two positions, Lucy's and Halves, will be where the finalists are found. Um, and I've got the Blues first and the Lucy's. I think McMenamin, obviously massive um, injury. She came back for She contributed extremely well for the Black Ferns. She's hungry and she's in, you know, in and around in that eight spot. And I think Mickey too, you know how powerful she was throughout that whole World Cup. And I, I think between those two and bringing others with them, uh, they get the slight nod Slight not like Kennedy Simon at the Chiefs, you know, she is a, she's a leader, people want to follow her. It was hard for me. Uh, I know people won't believe that because I put the Blues at one, but for the Chiefs at two, I've got Mutt at two, um, at, at three, and then the Power at, at four. You happy with that? Yeah, we, I went pretty similar. I think with Bremner leaving as well, heading up to the Chiefs, I think is a massive uh, loss for them for Mutt at two. Um, so obviously the sister combo is... It's really was really big for Matatu and obviously who going up to the Chiefs, I think um, you know, it's gonna be a big loss for Matatu. So yeah, I've got no problems with what um with what you meant there, Joe, definitely. I, I similar in the halves, I've 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 put the blues there. I mean they've got World Player of the Year, it's hard not to put them there. I think um they've got Baylor that's come up from the Chiefs at nine, so it's a hell of a nine tier combination. And uh Malia po, obviously young player that came through Rose and you know, will be able to learn a hell of a lot of um demand at, at ten and may potentially play fullback. I don't know. Like she's got a I feel like she's a player Player that needs to be on the field for, for big minutes so she may have the ability to slip to 10 but I think having that depth puts the Blues ahead. You know for the Blues you know when you've got the best player in the world um, it helps definitely in the inside position and I think when you look at the other side of the spectrum with Mata too um, you've obviously got Kendra Cox here too, who's left um, who's been massive for, for that southern region you've got Rosie Kelly there that's, um, that's played the last couple of matches at 10 who's traditionally at 15 has played a little bit of 9 and might see the ship at 10 so um, and then you've got Hazel Chubik who brings a different element when it comes to that kicking game we talk around a lot in the um, Black Ferns with her ability to be able to kick in Dellinger who I thought um, was great for Manawa too in um, the NPC yeah. provincial area so the more opportunities that she can get um, at the Hurricanes level um, she's going to be massive for the power but um, yeah look I think you've got the Blues at top and you've got DeMont um, if she can play anywhere to the level that she was playing at that Rugby World Cup um, she'll be great for the Blues um, in their um, quest to try to win a championship mm. Midfielders? Another tough one, um, but I went Mata too. Reason being, it's probably not so much about the Black Ferns, but Grace Brooke is there. Um, she's she's been you know fairly experienced. Obviously played for the Black Ferns. Um, Mata Ellie's there as well. Uh, she played at centre on the weekend, and and obviously Amy Duplessis. Um, I haven't seen her strip, so um, it's no guarantee that she'll play, but um, she needs to be factored in there. So I had Mata too. Um, I've got the Chiefs. It is a big loss losing Chelsea Semple, um, so uh, not easy to replace. But when you've got a back line that has Hohepa and Wycliffe in it, and, and I don't know what the matchup may be. I don't know if they'll actually be in the midfield, but I think they both can play a role there if, if needed. So I've gone, obviously, the Chiefs seconds. Uh, the Blues, again, a lot of young talent around. Uh, and to be fair, Sylvia Brunt is, is still a young talent herself, but she's <laughs> hellishly effective. So she's, she's the sort of player that you know, could be the difference for the Blues in that midfield, but I've got them at third, and, and then I've just got the power at, at fourth, just, you know, again, just experience and, and time in the saddle. Mm. There is a lot of talent through that midfield. You can hear through those teams across the board. Yeah, there is. And I think oh, I've got Mata too first as well. I think bringing Grace Brooker back in um, is going to be huge for, for them. I know she had a, a really serious injury, and I know when I was down there um, at the Crusaders, she was just working very, very hard and pretty gutted that she was um, not going to be available for the Rugby World Cup. So she's really motivated and looks like she's come back rearing, really fits and to go. And so one other game name that you missed, that there could be a possibility if there are injuries, you've got Grace Steinmetz there as well, yeah. um, who's obviously been she's been great for that um, for that team as well. So. Depth-wise, uh, Mata 2 look very, very good. Um, you've obviously got Hohep and Wycliffe that you included. Simple is massive, a, a big loss, Jip. I think the ability that she can have uh, when it comes to kicking and being able to distribute in that 12 range, we talk about at the men's level how important it is, and it's more important at, um, at the women's rugby as well. So, And then you've got the Blues and the Power who are a little bit more inexperienced. But again, a lot inexperienced, we're probably going to see a lot more um, names after this, se this season that we're going to be looking forward for um, future honours because they're going to be given opportunities and, and players that we don't know and we're not accustomed to seeing um, at this level. Outsides. I've, I've gone Mata too again um, because they've got um, Holmes obviously at fullback, Robin zretti has gone down there so um, I think they, they stack a lot of um, firepower but also they, they fit those players so their work off the ball and being able to cover that backfield and inject themselves on attack is, is probably the way they got over. I've gone Pola second, I just think any team with... <laughs> Um, Alicia Litianga in it is just too ruthless. Like it's just too hard to stop. 
Um, so, and I think Sabritsky uh, Nafatali, um, Victoria at, at 15 potentially, she obviously can play 10 as well, but I think Dellinger will probably in that 10 role and, and she can pro provide a great supporting act um, for Alicia um, in the back three there. So I've gone the pole second, uh, Blues third and, and Chiefs, just because of the firepower they've lost in, in players like you know, Flula, Tui and um, um, Portia Woodman as well. So yeah. Let's have a look at your top four then. What does it go? Uh, I've gone Blues, Chiefs, Matatu, Power, And I just think in those areas of Lucy's and Halves will be the difference. Um, I'm going Matatu, Chiefs, Blues and uh, Power. That's how I'm finishing. Right. There That's close. Go. That's close. Okay, so this weekend, Hurricanes, Power versus Chiefs, Manua. Chiefs. Chiefs? Chiefs. And Matatu against the Blues, Bryn? <laughs> Do we need to ask? <laughs> yeah. From what I've said, if I pick the Blues, I'm absolutely yeah. hypocrite. So I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll go the Matatu, but they've got to perform, they've got to perform though, because like I said last year, they, were, they had some good players, but weren't able to put it on the field. So I think I'll if they if they are going to win, they're going to need to utilise their type five and go through the middle. I think that's that's probably their yeah. one area in terms of experience, Black Ferns experience. If they go through the middle, um, it'll provide enough. Um, time and space, no matter who's you know sort of in the Lucys or the halves, you know, because I think much too have got Kendra Reynolds gone down there as well from the Chiefs, so it's not like they're light in the Lucys. It is a tough call. Um, I think this competition's very tight, and um, so if they can utilise that type type five, it will give them an opportunity. Now, if you are on Sky and you got the ability to tune in this Wednesday night, you can see the women's game. It's our new show about Opiki, but also about women's sport in general, a conversation about the issues within the game. We'll even talk to fans and we'll talk to players from other sports. What do they have in common? Professional cricketers, professional sailors, professional footballers. What are the issues within professional women's sport that need to be talked about? The women's game starts this Wednesday, six weeks on Sky Sport. It's a really exciting show. Hosted by Laura McGoldrick, Ruby Tui, Ruahe Demant, star started first oh. episode. It's going to be very good. So please tune into that if you have the ability to. So moving on from there, let's head up north. Because goodness me. How yes. good is it? This yes. Six Nations is on fire. On and off. On and oh, off. Scotland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, Scotland is really interesting. They're about to go over and play France, and, you know, they could get a boil over there. Well, they, they're definitely, they've got the ability to. Um, you know, it will be hard, uh, but they seem to be lifting trophies every, every week at this stage. So I, I think it's an exciting game. It's probably a lot closer than we would have predicted, you know, to the latter end of last year. Um, but it shows when you get a bit of belief and, and a bit of clarity on how you want to play the game, um, you know, they've, they've, got, they've got plenty to prove. Uh, playing with confidence. France probably might have dipped in a little bit of confidence, but I think the French, if they can get back to their, you know, sort of going through the middle and then allowing that time and space for, you know, their, their gun players, then they'll be hard to beat in France. Look, I think Scotland, man, if there's ever a time for them to, to get a bit of confidence and beat France, it'd be, it'd be this game, you know, getting that win in England um, and at Twickenham was huge for their confidence to be able to do that away from home and then being able to get the result where they, you know, they where they should have won and they did um, in the second round. So um, I'm still picking France, but look, Scotland are playing a, a good brand of footy um, with Finn Russell um, leading them around and Van der Merwe just scoring um, great tries from 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 his own half. Um, if they can do that, um, they're a, they're a, they're a puncher's chance against France and France. Now, if you usually talk about an England Wales clash, you're usually talking about how much the Welsh players want to get into it. Right now, we're talking about whether or not the Welsh players are even going to turn up for this game based on the action that they're taking against the union to go against this regionalised deal and possibly lower pay. There is a lot going on there. They've obviously had the culture issues, the misogyny, the sexism claims, all those things that are going on within the Welsh union. It's a mess over there. What kind of position as a player in mentally when they're thinking about whether they're not going to going to play the game while preparing for it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of distractions. Like it just even you know the change of coach um, is a big factor as well. You know they're going to take a bit of time um, to to get their mojo back, and then obviously with off-field distractions, um, it's not ideal. I don't know what the position is. I, I think it would be. It must mean it's an, to not turn up to a test match is a, is a real sign that there's a, there is not much of a connection there um, between the powers that be and the players. So hopefully they can rectify it because you don't want the fans to suffer. 
um, but you've also got to respect um, that the players are, are standing up for what they believe in and their livelihood. Yeah. You know, when you talk around livelihood and some of the comments that came out, you know, there was talks around ant taking antidepressants and I guess um, not being able to afford mortgages. And, you know, when that kind of stuff's um, coming at the forefront of the media, it's not great for a message around where Wales rugby is at the moment. And so, um, but I think the most important thing, selfishly as players, you've got to be able to, to do what's best for yourself and, and your team environment. And so I think Alan Wynne Jones had it on the head and he brought it up really well when he was posed that question was around, um, Ideally, they know that they're in a very fortunate situation to be able to play rugby for professionally, and it's the last, it's the last, it's the last action that they want to do to be able to not play a test match. But at the same time, they have to look after themselves, and within the group, they feel that they're not very, very, uh, they're not feeling treated in the way that they need to. So, um, I think as players, they're doing the right thing for themselves in that group, what they think's best. Um, and I think you know, it almost gives them an upper hand to try and talk to Wales Rugby Union and hopefully they can make a decision where they can come a little bit closer together because obviously they're on different spectrums at the moment and so you know obviously Players Association and working with, with New Zealand players um, it's been able to work for the player and been able to get it right because ideally this hasn't been happening it hasn't been a short term where they've been thinking this um, it's just happened it's been working for a very long time where the Welsh players haven't been happy and so they're all aligned and hopefully it can come together before this um, for the before this test match. You hope that the people behind doors are, are having the necessary conversations that is for the betterment of, of everyone involved. Um, and it sounds like there probably needs to be compromise um, both sides. So let's imagine the game's going ahead. Who wins it? England, I think. There's just too many distractions. Like Bryn said, like if you're worried about paying your mortgage and things like that and your mates are worried about, even if it's your mates, if it's not you, potentially the Welsh players, it's, it's the ones that are in the squads um, that, you know, aren't getting as much as maybe they do, um, you know, that's a, that's a lot of pressure. Um, and England are, are under a lot of pressure with a new coach, but their focus is razor sharp, I think, in terms of uh, where they want to go and where they want to take the game. So you'd have to think they go on favourites and get the job done. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Brent? Yeah, it's, yeah, I think um, yeah, I'm definitely going to England. I just think it's the brand of footy that um, that Wales are playing as well. Um, it's probably just not, and I know there's obviously a lot of off-field off, off issues that maybe are leading to that, but yeah, I just don't think they, that the way that they're playing, the style of, uh, that they're playing um, is really um, going to pose too many questions to have the result go their way. So I'm backing, I'm backing England, but again, it could galvanise the group as well. If they do end up playing and they get those agreements and it gets compromised before the test match, it might be able to galvanise and they've got absolutely nothing to lose. Um, nobody's expecting them to win. Look, we're not expecting them to win. So, you know, what a great way that Warren Gatlin might be able to word that around that, if, you know, nobody thinks you should win and, um, you know, might galvanise them and they might get the job done. Ireland versus Italy. Ireland. Ireland? Yeah. Ireland, obviously. Ireland. But I love Italy. I love how Italy's playing, but they don't get the job done. But I think they're um, they're making some massive improvements in their game. And, um, yeah, I've been loved watching them play their fullback as well. Um, it's been great, So, but I'll go Ireland. That's us for this particular Oof. show for the big return. We got through it. Welcome back, lad. Yeah. Yeah, good time. Poor old people watching. Yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> We'll, um, but we've got a few cool things coming, don't we? You know, we I, do. That will include the people, so it's exciting. Yeah. So we really want to engage with you this year, like I said, whether that's in the comments section, we're working on a way for you guys to feed us videos to include your contributions and obviously the tipping comp. Whoever wins our league in the tipping comp, like we did last year, you'll get a chance to come on the show and just offload all of your big opinions, tell us what you think of us, you know. Just, just let it go. So thank you very much for tuning in. If more people tune in, we'll probably go from the number four rugby podcast in Sweden to, yeah, to yeah, number to one. Yeah, number one, surely. Huge in Portugal too. So, <laughs> you know, please, please definitely tune in and keep out of Jipper's DMs this year. He's going to say some or things. Or just be nice. Be nice to him. So um, catch us on Sky Sport, on the Rugby Pass platforms, YouTube, audio pod distributors, everywhere you can. Thanks again, Bryn Hall, for joining us. Thanks, lads. Great to be back, fellas. It's great to be back and chat some code. So looking forward to it. Awesome year ahead. Actually, before we go, it's like an episode of Cribson behind him. <laughs> the shoes and the walk-in oh, wardrobe. Pristine. Goodness me. I imagine jewellery drawers oh, and all yeah. sorts of things in there. You obviously don't have shaving foam, but you, know, you probably can get some. Oh, I'm in Japan now, mate. So I think um, I've been told to be kept, but no. Oh, I'm, yeah, um, nice. Nah, it'll, be, it'll, be going, it'll be going very shortly. It's pretty <laughs> tough to get a haircut around here, mate. So. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, yeah. pretty tough. But you still look immaculate, so that's that's one positive. Oh, I'm not looking as good as you. Oh, I'm have, just mate. trying to take the heat off no, myself. No, no. That <laughs> fine. No, he's not yeah, even going to wear uh, sleeves next week on the show. <laughs> get a singy on. I'm going to wear a, a sk- I'm going to wear a skivvy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> James Parsons, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you, Paul, for coming on with us here on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. More of this nonsense to come for another 40 weeks. Good luck to you. We really enjoy bringing it to you. Mate wa.